Good morning, everyone. My name is Hunter Upton. I am one of the pastors here at Goodwill Church South Haven. Uh, So delighted that you're worshiping with us, whether you're here at our South Haven campus or you're joining us online, however, wherever. It's such an honor and a privilege to worship our Lord this morning as we're together uh, to just glorify Him in all that we do. I want to let you know, I want to take a second here to let you know about something coming up the Sunday following Easter Sunday. So Easter Sunday is April the 4th. And on April the 11th, we will have a special Q&A Sunday, a question and answer Sunday. Now, I'm not real sure what I'm getting into here, but Jonathan and I will be taking questions and we will be hopefully answering uh, those on that Sunday. And so we, we need your questions. If you've got a question about God, about Jesus, about the church, about Christianity, whatever the question is, and if they're really out there, we'll let Jonathan answer them. But we would love your questions, so send them in. Uh, You can do so by filling out the card that's in your seat. You can put those in the offering boxes as you leave today. Uh, Or if you're, uh, you can submit them online. If you're joining us online, there's a link in the chat box because we don't want to leave you out either uh, to fill those out. Uh, Let us know your questions. We're going to start compiling those and putting those together. So please, please, please send us in your questions for that special Sunday coming up on April the 11th. Now, we've been walking through our series called Thread, where we've been looking at how Jesus is like a thread woven throughout all of Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, about how God's plan of redemption has been unfolding since the very beginning, uh, even to now and even even to the time to come. This is our arc here that we've been walking through. Uh, We started with creation, right? Genesis, very beginning of the Bible, very beginning of time, and at how God has been at work in each of these stages. And now last week, uh, Jonathan Wallace, our our lead pastor, uh, talked about the ministry of Jesus, how Jesus is the only one uh, through whom we can find salvation, that Jesus' death on a cross is what gives us life, and how we have, we're all about, we're people who are all about Jesus, right? And so today we're looking at the early church, but remember we're walking each week until we get to Christmas, uh, to Christmas, to Easter, uh, where we look at the return of Christ. It is kind of like a Christmas, it's just a second one. Anyway, All right, back to the notes. Here we go. So uh, today we're talking about the early church, which picks up after the Gospels. So we have the four Gospels right now. At the end of the four Gospels, each and every Gospel, Jesus has been resurrected, all right? And so where we pick up today is at the beginning of Acts. So if you've got a Bible or a device you read from, let's turn to Acts chapter 1. Uh, that's where we'll be. Acts chapter 1, this is Jesus. He's, appear, he's, he's been beaten. He's, been, he's died. He's been crucified, right? But he's risen from the dead three days later, just as he promised he would. And now, before he ascends to heaven, he's spent 40 days appearing to the disciples and to other followers of Jesus uh, during this time. And, and where we pick up today in Acts chapter 1, verse 4, uh, Jesus is sitting and having a meal with the disciples. And these are his final words, his parting words uh, to, to them. So picking up Acts chapter 1, verse 4, Jesus says, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So Jesus gives his parting words. And there are three things that we can observe from these words that he leaves them with, that he tells the disciples. The first is this, is that there will be a gift given to them in the Holy Spirit. Look at verses 4 and 5. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with what? This gift is the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit. Now, this isn't the first time that Jesus has talked about the Holy Spirit. And honestly, it's not the first time that the Bible speaks of this Holy Spirit. Jesus taught about the Holy Spirit in his kind of final sermon to his disciples in the upper room in John 14. He mentioned that, that this Spirit would come as, as an advocate, as a, as a counselor, as one with them, his presence with them. And he told them this as he was making his willing journey to the cross. You see, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God, it's the presence of God, the power of Jesus to all believers. 
Even the Old Testament that we've walked through for for many, many weeks, even in the Old Testament, we see the Spirit alive and active on the scene. But the thing about the Old Testament is that the Holy Spirit would come and would act and be part of of something that God was up to, but then just as quick as the Spirit came, the Spirit would leave again. The Spirit wasn't permanent yet in the Old Testament. But what we see is that Jesus is promising a permanent Spirit. Joel Chapter 2, one of the prophets of the Old Testament prophesies about this, tells about God's promise that the Spirit would be poured out one day to stay permanent. The Spirit to come, God's presence dwelling in his people. And just as God had promised, God's Spirit does come. And we find that in Acts chapter 2, the very beginning, that God pours out his Spirit upon the believers there in Jerusalem during the day of Pentecost. The Spirit, the very presence of God with his people, within his people, helping us to to live as God wants us to and helping us to carry out his mission here on earth. You see, friends, the, the Holy Spirit was part, is part of God's redemptive plan that he's carrying out in the world. And it's the Spirit that, that empowers us to choose to be free from our sin. We now have a choice. We don't have to stay shackled to the sin. We have a choice now because of the Holy Spirit's power in us. And we have the power to follow Jesus, to be with God once and for all. See, the Spirit, it changes our minds, our hearts, our our wills, and our wants, sometimes more than than we want to let go of. But we, we start to begin to care about what Jesus cared about and to begin to be his hands and feet. But more than than just this change in behavior that often happens because of the Spirit with us, there's something even greater than that. Is that God's presence, Jesus is with us. Jesus is in us. How awesome is that? We begin to, to feel his presence. We begin to have comfort that only he can provide. That's the Spirit in us. And when we look throughout all the book of Acts, we see, the, we see God's Spirit coming upon those who call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. And one of the great things is, is that even today, those of us who call on the name of the Lord to be saved can also have that same Spirit that filled the early church believers. That's the Spirit. That's God's Spirit alive and active today. So that was the first, that there would be a gift. The second is this, is that they may not completely understand the the early church, the disciples. They may not know what all the plans are that the Lord has, but they can trust God. Look at verses 6 and 7. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Their question is good, but Jesus is like, your question might be a little, little off. So let me kind of rephrase that here. He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority? Great question, but let me, let me tell you something. You've walked with, the disciples, they walked with, with Jesus for three years. They saw him perform awesome miracles of God. They heard him teach about God in ways that no other teacher had ever done before. And they're still asking questions that, that seem a little different than, like, they want all the answers, right? They just want all the answers laid out for them. And Jesus says, hey, but you You're not going to have all the answers, but you can trust that God is at work. I think that we're kind of like the disciples. We want to have all the answers to our questions. I've got plenty of questions. I'm going to ask them all one day whenever I get before Jesus. But what he asked me to do is to just trust God. What Jesus is, is telling them is you've got to, when you don't see what God is fully up to, you've got to step out in faith. When he's pointing you in one direction, you've just got to step out in faith and trust him and obey him in what he's doing. Knowing that he's at work well ahead of you. Working out his good will and his purposes of what he's called us to. He, he wants to work, but he needs us to trust him. We have to trust God and we have to obey God. We have to do what he's called us to do. And the, the, the early church, they did that. They did just that. We wouldn't be where we are today if they didn't do that. They didn't have all the answers. They didn't know how this was going to unfold. And yet, they knew that God was faithful. He always has been and he always will be to what he has promised. So, they may not completely understand, but they can trust God. And our third observation from a passage is this. Is that they, the the disciples, we have been given an invitation to join in the mission of God. 
an invitation to join in the mission of God. Verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. God's redemptive plan, it, it had come about. It was achieved once and for all in Jesus, in his sacrifice on a cross, his blood spilled for us, taking our place that we deserve on the cross for our sin. He's the one who brings about this redemption. But this message of salvation that's now to go to the ends of the earth, who, who's supposed to take it? I'm going to tell you one thing. I am astonished and, and sometimes just like intrigued that God uses us. God uses me, but God uses like this lot here to, to do his work, to carry about this mission, this, this message of the good news to the world. He chooses to use us, his followers, as, as his vessels of this message that he has for the world of new life in Jesus. And what we see when you start working through the book of Acts, you begin to see the, the, the gospel going out from Jerusalem and then to Judea and Samaria. It just begins to ripple effect until you get to the end of the book of Acts and to the very ends of the known earth, the good news of Jesus Christ is going forth. We've been given this invitation to be part of the mission of God, to take his message to the masses. And it's by the power of the Holy Spirit that believers are able to fulfill the promise that was given in Isaiah 49.6. Isaiah 49.6 says this. This is the Lord. He says, I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. I will make you a light to the Gentiles that you may bring my message of salvation to the ends of the earth. Salvation comes through Jesus alone. There is no other way to salvation. It's through Jesus alone. He's the one who was promised to Abraham that through his family, all the peoples of earth would be blessed. That's the message. That's the invitation that we are able to give others that we're called to as his, belief, as his followers. And so it's with those parting words that, that Jesus is then taken up into heaven. He ascends to heaven. He takes his seat at the right hand of God's throne in heaven. And he, he judges and he reigns and he rules over the kingdom of God as it's breaking in even today into the world. Until this one day, he will come back. And all of the new heavens and the new earth will take place. All these tears that we have will be wiped away. And we will see the glory of God once and forever and for all. That is what is to come. And so, if we were to walk through the book of Acts, if we were to, to go through the letters of the New Testament, as we look at the early church, we would see the testimony of the Holy Spirit at work in the lives of the early church as they trust God with boldness, uh, as they carry out his mission, the one that God had entrusted them with. Now, I wish that we had time to dive into all these stories, but they only give me so much time up here. So um, we're going to kind of talk about four things that, that I feel like we can glean, we can take lessons we can learn uh, from the early church, okay? And we can apply these to our lives today. The first is this. The early church, they had a faith that produced obedience. They had a faith that produced obedience. Like we said earlier, they, they couldn't see the whole plan at the time, right? It, what, they couldn't see how all this was going to pan out, and yet they were trusting the Lord and that he was working, and they wanted to be part of what he was doing. They wanted to keep in step with the Spirit. They believed that Jesus was the Redeemer who takes away the sins of the world and gives us new life. And y'all, they, believe, they believed that so much that they would go to even the furthest extent. They would even give up their own lives to make sure that the gospel would be proclaimed. Time and time again, chapter after chapter, what we see is how they step out in obedience to what the Lord had called them to. One question that I have for us is, are, are we known for having a faith that produces obedience? Are you and I known for having a faith that produces obedience? I think that for some of us, we've got the faith thing down pretty good. We, we love Jesus. We want to know more about Jesus. He, he is so good. We, we thank you, Lord, for saving us from our sins. But whenever it comes to doing what Jesus has called us to, we sure enough don't do that. Ooh, I'm not sure. I, I really like this relationship I have with Jesus, but I'm not sure that I really want to like actually do what he tells me to. We get uncomfortable with that. 
And then I think there's some of other of us that we're really good with the obedience part. Like I've got my checklist, I've done this, 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 right? Um, but yet what happens is we, we have no relationship with Jesus. We've got all the obedience, but no relationship, no faith in, in Jesus. And so what we have to be careful of, church, is make sure that we marry faith and obedience together. And so I encourage you, pray, ask the Lord, point out where is it that you've disconnected those two things that you can come back into that right relationship that Jesus wants to have with you, that he would work in you, but also through you. So the early church, they had a faith that produced obedience. Second thing is this. They had a passion that produced unity. They had a passion that produced unity. The book of Acts talks about the early church as if they were in one accord. One accord. And, and if you were to take and look at the Greek word, it really means that they were one-minded. They had one mind. Okay? So the early church, they had one mind, one heart, one will, one passion. But for what? It's Jesus. Jesus. They had one heart. One mind, one passion for Jesus. And what they saw is that this passion for Jesus brought them together under the kingdom of God, unlike anything else in all of creation. And by the end of Acts chapter 2, what we find is that they not only hold everything in common, but they, they devote themselves to learning more about Jesus and to caring for one another. Those are the two things that they really devote themselves to. And that's because Jesus was the cornerstone of everything that they did. Everything that they knew and everything that they were, it was Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Now, I'm sure that you're well aware, but we live in a more divided time than ever, right? What we really desire, what people are really striving for is something that has unity, this lasting unity. But the thing is, is that there's only one thing that we can really unify around that really brings true unity, and that's Jesus. There's nothing else. It doesn't matter. Like, we try to unify around being conservative or progressive. Maybe we want to unify about, about being around one denomination. Maybe it's, you know, we want to be bulldogs, which is the right way, or rebels or tigers, whatever it is. Like, we, we, try, to, we try to unify around what we're for, or what we're against, right? We, we find common bond in those things, but friends, there's only one thing that brings unity. There's only one person that breaks down the walls that we build around ourselves that can bring true unity, and that's Jesus Christ. That's what the early church knew. That's what they had passion for, that Jesus would be the one that they cared about, that Jesus is the only person that can bring wholeness and healing and hope to the world. It's Jesus. Are we a people that are passionate about Jesus? Or is he just another man? Is he just a second thought? We need to be like the early church. We need to have a passion for Jesus to see what he can do, what kind of unity he can produce in our lives, in our world. Third thing is this. They had a desperation that produced prayer. They had a desperation that produced prayer. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I find myself kind of at the end of myself. You know, like I've exerted all the energy I can, and I am not sure how to move forward uh, from there. And that's exactly where I think the early church probably found themselves numerous times over the course of what they had been called to do. This, this mission that God called them to it was so much bigger than themselves that they had to reach outside of themselves to find help. What God has called us to, it seems impossible. This very mission seems impossible. But the early church knew that they had to reach out to God in prayer. They needed him to act. They needed him to move. They needed him to do the things that he wanted to do. I can come up with great ideas. At least I think they're great. But the truth is, is that they pale in comparison to the ideas and the ways that the Lord has and wants for my life and for the people around me. What I need to do is, is realize that I can't do it on my own. We live in a culture that says, hey, you've got this. You can do it. Anything you want to muster up, you can do. But the truth is, I can't. I can't. I, I don't need to. What I need is, is for God to act. I need him to guide me, to give me wisdom, to show me the way. 
And every time I find myself trying to do things on my own or on my own strength, I realize that I can't and I need God. So I need to reach out to him and pray and ask for him to give me what I need, to, to make ways that only he can make, to do the things that only he can do. For me to step out of the way and let him be God. That's what I need to do. God can do the impossible. He really can. He's, he's done it numerous times before. But God wants us to reach out to him, to, to ask him to come alongside us, to, to lead us and empower us in the mission that he's called us to. The early church did that. We should do that. We should follow suit. We should hit our knees and pray and ask God, seek God, and ask him to lead us and guide us. Let's be like the early church. Let's have that kind of desperation that produces prayer. Fourth thing is this. Last thing here. They had the spirit that produced power. They had the spirit that produced power. This kind of power, this kind of of boldness, this kind of new life had never been witnessed before prior to the spirits pouring out uh, at Pentecost. The church, the people of God, they, they're now empowered by the, the Holy Spirit, by, by God's own presence and power with them, but also the presence and power of God through them. Not just with them, but also through them. They, they now are able to say yes to God. They have the choice to say yes to God, but they also have the choice to say no to sin and temptation. They actually had the power to actually follow Jesus for the first time wholeheartedly in love with him to do what he's called them to do by the power of Jesus. For all who've called upon the name of the Lord, we have that same power available to us in the Spirit today. One thing that we need, I think more than anything, is, is just a fresh outpouring of the Spirit upon our churches today, especially our church. Just We need the Spirit to come and lead us. We need to be aware of his presence. We need to be, under, we need, we need to be aware of where he's taking us and leading us, where he's at work in the world. I found this quote this week. Uh, Jonathan pointed it out to me, and, it, and it's, it stings a little bit, but it comes from A.W. Tozer. He says, if the Holy Spirit was, was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we do would go on and no one would know the difference. If the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did would stop and everybody would know the difference. What a shame it is that that we do what we do a lot of the time without any prodding or dependence upon the Holy Spirit. The early church depended on the power of the Spirit. Let us be a church. Let us be a people. Let me be a man that does depend upon God's Spirit to come and move in His power to work in and through me that people would see the difference. This is what the world needs. They need the Spirit to make a difference in their lives. So the early church, they were all about Jesus. They were all about Jesus because He's the only one who can bring new life Nothing that we do can ever bring new life to our own selves. We can't bring ourselves out of a lot of the situations that we've put ourselves in, but only Jesus can. And they desired for for Jesus to be made much of, that others would see and know and experience this new life that Jesus brings to them. Acts is filled with stories of of life change, but fortunately, it's not the only place where we find stories of life change. One of the beautiful things is, is that God is still moving today. God's still moving in our church today. So I want to share a story because I love sharing stories. I want to share a story uh, of Courtney. Um, Courtney gave me permission to share this story. But several weeks ago, I was introduced to Courtney in the church office. um, And she was meeting with Kim. and, And not long ago, Courtney found herself walking through one of the most difficult moments in her life one of the most difficult moments in her life. And she said that it seemed impossible to see any kind of light at the end of the tunnel and and that nothing brought her joy and she just questioned everything about her life. But there was one place that she felt safe and loved and genuinely cared for, and that was at work. This is where Penny enters the story. Penny had just become the nursing manager of her floor, 
And when all of this hit, Penny found out and knew, and she wanted to come alongside Courtney uh, to have her understand and know and experience the life change that she had experienced also in Jesus. And so Courtney had taken a leave of absence, and Penny made repeated efforts to reach out to her, to, to let her know that she's there for her, to let her know that there is hope out there, to, to pray with her. And so time and time again, Penny just knew the circumstances going on in her life and knew that she needed to talk with someone that she could trust to help her see some of the light inside of this tunnel. And so one day, Penny takes off work, grabs Courtney, and brings her here to the church to meet with Kim Ball, our women's ministry coordinator. And here's the thing. Penny, Penny didn't just come and, and drop her off. Penny stayed in the parking lot while she met with Kim and then took her back home afterwards. That's because Penny understood and saw just the, the beauty of a relationship with Jesus, the beauty of what Jesus can do in a life, and wanted that same hope, that same beauty to come from Courtney's life as well. And so Penny invited Courtney to get well many times. Uh, Penny sa uh, Courtney said that, you know, she had just hadn't been going to church in many months. Honestly, she was angry at God. Uh, that was part of it. But the other part was she knew that there would probably be a little bit of shame that she would feel from coming back to a place where people knew her and knew some of her situation. That Sunday that she came to church, she finally stepped out and said, I'm, I'm going to come. She was met with Penny's warm embrace, and it helped to calm her nerves, to break away those chains of, of shame, and her to feel really welcome here at, at Getwell. Courtney said this, said that Penny will never know how much her gentle spirit, her prayers, and her acts of kindness did for my faith. Courtney's life wasn't changed just because Getwell is a good church. This is a great church. Courtney's life was changed because she opened up her life to what Jesus could do in her. She opened her life up to Jesus. That's what changed Courtney's life. Penny chose Courtney to be her one, to, to come alongside her and to invite her into new life. And Courtney has benefited from that and is so grateful. This is a great story. And guess what? It doesn't end there. And that's because of this truth here. Is that the gospel always comes to us on its way to someone else. Let that sink in. The gospel always, the good news of Jesus always comes to us on its way to someone else. It's not ours to keep. It's not ours to frame and put on the wall or to bottle up and we're going to keep it for ourselves and maybe one day. But no, the gospel comes to us on its way to someone else. And the beauty of this story is that it doesn't stop with Courtney. Courtney began to feel this, this tug in her spirit that, that this life that she has found in Jesus, that, that others need this same hope, the same beautiful transformation that can come from Jesus. And she began to look around her life and see these circumstances and situations and dynamics that she's been put in. She begins to invite her family, her friends, her co-workers to church as well, that they may be introduced to Jesus also. That's beautiful. And guess what? That stepping out, that invitation, not only from Penny, but that stepping out from Courtney has changed an entire wing of our hospital. There are nurses, there are patients that now know Jesus, now follow Jesus and know the life that he brings because of these, these small and beautiful actions. They start their meetings each day with prayer. They, they find themselves now stopping and praying with patients throughout the day. They, they strive to be the hands and feet of Jesus to all the families that come through their floor throughout the week. This is a beautiful story of that one simple action of stepping out, of inviting others, of sharing the good news that's not ours to keep, to give to someone else that the message of salvation, the message, the good news of Jesus, that life change can happen. That's what we're called to do. And so church, I ask you this question. Who is your one? God, yes, wants to, wants to change the world. But if I've seen anything, even in this one little story here, of God's great work, it takes one. It takes one.
So who's your one? Who's that one that God is calling you to? To come alongside and to share the message of, of new life in Jesus with? Who is that one? Who's the one that pops in your brain? Whoever that is, there's a, there's a space there on the bulletin. Write their name down. And if you're like, Hunter, I'm not sure that I, I have a name. That's fine. That's good. What I want you to do is pray. I want you to ask the Lord, point out that one person in my life that I'm going to come across that I need to share the good news of Jesus with. Here's the thing. What we're called to do is to invite people into a relationship with Jesus, to introduce them to this Jesus that we love and that we have passion for. But it's the Spirit's work, it's the Lord's work to change their lives. But I don't want to stand in the way of the Spirit being able to do something in their lives. So let us find that one so that God's mission can go on from here, that it can leave South Haven and go to DeSoto County and go to Mississippi and go to the United States and go beyond. We do this because of the love of Jesus. The early church had that kind of love. And we do it through the power of the Holy Spirit that we would live like Jesus and that we would love like Jesus as well. Let's pray. Father, you are, are so good. We are so thankful that we have your word. Lord, that we can see those that have come before us. Lord, that even though they may not have uh, had all the answers, Lord, that they were faithful and they trusted you and they were obedient to you. And so God, I just ask that you would use us, each and every single one of us in this room, each and every single one that can hear my voice. Lord, that they, that we would know your goodness, your grace, not only for ourselves, Lord, but for the sake of this world that you love so much, that you died for, that you wanna have a relationship with, that you wanna transform, that you wanna bring new life to. Jesus, point out that one in our lives that we can be your hands and feet to, that we can introduce them to your son, Jesus. And Lord, help us to be a people that are passionate for Jesus above everything and anything else. You are worthy to be praised. You can have all of our lives, Lord Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. If there's something that we can pray for you about, our altars will be open. Jonathan and I will be down here. We'd be happy to pray with you. Uh, you can just motion us over. I encourage you to pray at your seat uh, during this, talk, this song of response. Ask God, who is that one? Ask him to fill you with his Holy Spirit. Let's see what he's going to do. Because he can do the impossible and he can do the unfathomable. Because he is our God. Let's worship. Let's stand.